very hopeful to finish his PhD <laughs> in the next six, seven years. And he's, going, and he's going to give a very nice talk about return-oriented flash reload. OK. Hello, everyone. My name is Xiao Kuan Zhang. I'm from the Ohio State University. Today, I'm going to present my paper, Return-Oriented Flash Reload Side Channels on ARM and Their Implications for Android Devices. This is a joint work with Yuan Xiao and Professor Yin Qian Zhang. Catch side channel attacks is one of the side channel attacks in which the attacker can learn sensitive information by monitoring cache accesses made by victim in a shared computer system. There are many different kinds of uh, cache side channel attacks. We focus on the thread model in which the attacker and the victim are running on the same physical machine. Among all the cache side channel attacks, two most famous ones are prime probe and flash reload. In prime probe attack, the attacker and the victim share the same cache sets in set associative cache. It's assumed that the virtual to physical mapping of the victim is known to the attacker. Flash reload attack works on cache lines. It's required that the attacker and the victim share the same physical memory. In our, our paper, we focus on the flash reload at attack. First, let's see how flash reload works on Intel x86. We have three levels of caches here, and the victim and the attacker are running on different cores. In the beginning, they may have the same ca cache line loaded in their caches, respectively. So first, the attacker will execute the, fl uh, the flash instruction, which is CL flash on Intel x86. So the cache line will be flushed out of the entire cache hierarchy in the attacker core. Then since the last level cache is inclusive, the same cache line in the victim core will also be flushed. After the flush, the attacker will stay idle for a certain period of time. And during this idle period, the victim may visit the same cache line again, filling the cache line into its L1, L2, and L3 cache. After the idle period, the attacker may perform a reload and measure the time using RATSC. If a fast reload is observed, it means that the cache line is in the L3 cache, which indicates that the victim has accessed the cache line during the idle period. So here is a brief summary of the flash reload attack. A flash reload cycle consists of flash, idle, and reload. To perform the flash reload attack, the attacker needs to repeat the flash reload cycle for multiple times. If a fast reload is observed, it means that the victim has access to the cache line. On the other hand, if a reload is slow, then the victim did not access the cache line. So flash reload has been done on Intel x86. However, it has not been well studied on ARM devices. Yaron et al. proposed the concept of flash reload attack in their Usenix uh, 2014 paper. In their paper, they mentioned that flash reload is not applicable on ARM. So our question is, is this uh, true? Can, can we implement flash reload attacks on ARM? Here's an outline of the rest of my presentation. First, I will talk about how we explore ARM caches. Then I will introduce our return-oriented flash reload attacks we implement in the paper. Then I will present some case studies on Android. After that, I will conclude my presentation. Now let's go to ARM cache exploration. To conduct flash reload attacks on ARM, there are many two challenges. First, in Intel x86, we use CL flash to perform a flash. However, on ARM, the unprivileged cache flash instruction is unknown. Second, flash reload works on Intel because they have inclusive last level caches. Uh, but the cache inclusiveness on ARM is also unknown. So how to address these two challenges? Note that the, the last level cache on ARM is L2 cache. So from now on, when I say L2 cache, it means last level cache. Here's a brief summary of the flash reload requirements. First, the flash instruction 
to flush the local L1 cache, shared L2 cache, and the L1 cache of our cores. There's another requirement on the L2 cache, which is the victim's memory access must put the cache line into L2 cache so that the attacker will have a chance to observe it. The first two requirements of a flush are important since they enable the attacker to see the changes in the L2 cache. Let me, is, uh, let me explain the other two is, uh, requirements. First, what if the flush did not flush the L1 cache of other cores? In that case, after the flush, the cache line will remain in, in the victim's core in the victim's L1 cache. So when the attacker does a reload and measure the time, the timing will always be memory access time. So the la last requirement, the victims, what if the victims, the memory access did not put the cache line into L2 cache? In that case, after, after flush, all the cache lines will be flushed out of the cache. Then during the idle period, when the victim visits, visit the same cache line again, it will only present in the L1 cache. So when the attacker does a reload and measure the time, the timing will always be memory access time. So now I have explained why we need those requirements. Let's move on. Our attack model is that the attacker can use the zero permission Android app to perform the attack. So we need to find a user space cache flush interface that we can use without any privileges. We found a system call called clear cache. For clear cache, no privilege is required, so it meets our requirements. ARM does not um, maintain coherence between the data cache and the instruction cache. So to run self-modifying code, the application itself must Call clear cache system call to flush the stale instruction, uh, stale code from the instruction cache after it has been modified on the data side. So the clear cache is only designed to flush the instruction cache. However, there is no specification on how to implement this uh, system call. That is, whether flush the L1 instruction cache will also flush the shared L2 cache. Therefore, we need to empirically study the effect of clear cache. So our goal is to study the effect of clear cache, whether it will flush the local L1 cache, shell L2 cache, and the L1 cache of other cores. So we have designed several experiments. In our experiment, we use a zero permission Android app with NDK. And there are two threads running on two different cores. We have also implemented a 1K dummy function, which consists of knob instruction. In our first experiment, thread A will keep executing dummy, and thread B stays idle, which means that thread B will keep executing an empty while loop. The timing of executing dummy in thread A is T1. Since dummy will always be in the L1 cache, so T1 is L1 access time. In the next experiment, thread A will clean L1 and L2 cache before executing dummy, and thread B remains idle. The method to do the cleansing is in the appendix of our paper. After thread A cleanses L1 and L2, dummy will not present in the L1 and L2 cache anymore. So when thread A executes dummy a measure of time, the timing will always be memory access time. So the timing is T4. So we now have T1 and T4. What about T2 and T3? So in the next experiment, thread A will call clear cache before executing dummy, and thread B remains idle. The timing of executing dummy in thread A is T2. So T2 will tell us the effect of clear cache on local core. Similarly, in the last experiment, Thread A will keep executing dummy, and thread B will keep calling clear cache. The timing of executing dummy is T3. So T3 will tell us the effect of clear cache on another core. Here's a brief summary of our experiments. 
So T1 is L1 SS time, T4 is memory SS time. By comparing T2 and T3 with T1 and T4, we can learn the effects of clear cache on local and different cores. This is our test bed. We have, we have three phones, Samsung Galaxy S5, S6, and Google Nexus 6. Samsung S6 is ARM VA based, while S5 and Nexus 6 are ARM V7. We have five different types of CPUs here. This is, uh, this is our experiment result. Previously, I mentioned that there are three requirements for the flush interface. Not all processors satisfy the, those three requirements. From this figure, we can see that T2 and T3 of Cry 50, A15, and A7, though slightly greater than T1, are much smaller than T4. So clear cache did not flush the share L2 cache on these processors. On the other hand, A57 and A53 satisfy all the requirements. T2 and T3 of A57 and A53, though slightly smaller than T4, are much greater than T1. So clear cache will flush the local L1 cache, share L2 cache, and the L1 cache of other cores on these two processors. So now we are clear on the effects of clear cache system call. There's another requirement on the L2 cache. The victim's memory access must put the cache line into L2 cache. Therefore, we, we also need to know the cache inclusiveness on these processors. Is L2 cache inclusive, exclusive, or non-inclusive to the L1 cache? Inclusive means that the cache lines in L1 will be a subset of that in L2. Exclusive cache means that the cache lines in L1 will not present in L2. Non-inclusive cache means something in, be in between. We have designed uh, similar experiments to test the cache inclusiveness. Basically, it's also a timing side channel, uh, but I, I don't have enough time to explain the detail here. Uh, interesting readers can refer to our paper. Based on our exploration, we found that all the five processors we, we have tested have inclusive last level cache which is L2 cache. So recall that we have several requirements to perform the flash reload attack. Based on our exploration, we found that the two Unreal A processors, Cortex-A57 and A53, satisfy all requirements. Therefore, we demonstrate our attack on Samsung Galaxy S6. As they re represent the latest processor generations on the market, we anticipate future processors may have similar features. Actually, this is a general, general method to determine whether a processor is vulnerable to the flash reload attack. So now let me introduce the return-oriented flash reload attacks on ARM. Because we can only use uh, instruction cache reload, we have to execute an entire function to perform a reload which introduces several challenges. First, we need to reconstruct program semantics like arguments and global variables. Second, the execution time of a function may vary, which makes differentiating cache, cache hit and cache miss very challenging. Third, the flush and reload take too much time. Many, many fast victim operations may be missed. So how to address these three challenges? We are inspired by the concept of return-oriented programming. In return-oriented programming, the attacker can use certain techniques to override the return addresses of the victim program so that hijack the control flow of the victim without injecting any attacking code. In this example, the attacker overrides three return addresses stored in the heap of the victim program and makes them point to three gadgets inside shared libraries that the victim has already loaded so that the victim will execute these three gadgets without knowing it. So this concept can be ad adopted 
to tackle the challenges we are facing. This is the basic idea of our return-oriented reloads. We use a zero-permission Android app to perform the attack. In a shared library, we select several gadgets and we select several gadgets inside certain functions. Each gadget only consists of a return instruction. Although each gadget is only one instruction, when we load it, the entire cache line will, will be loaded into the cache. Before we jump to the gadget, we call our timer to get a timestamp T1. Then we jump to the three gadgets one by one. For each gadget, there will be a difference between cache heat and cache mix. Using three, using three gadgets can enhance the signal so that the attacker can differentiate cache mix and cache heat more easily. After returning from the last gadget, we will get timestamp T2. So the reload time will be T2 minus T1. Based on the value of T2 minus T1, we can, we can learn whether the victim has visited these functions. Here are the indirect control flow transfer instructions that we can use to implement our attack. We can make use of not only the return instructions, but also the branch instructions. We can also use move instruction to modify the PC value directly. In ARM v7, there is no return instruction, but on ARM v8, there is a return instruction. We can also specify a register after return to return to the address stored in that register. Now let's look at a concrete example. Suppose we want to reload, flush reload the clock get time function inside libc, and there are two gadgets inside this function. First, we let x19 store the address of the first gadget. Then we prepare other registers so that x4 will store the address of the instruction after branch. Then we jump to the first gadget, which is brx4. So it will return to the, to the address stored in x4, which is this. Then we put the, the address of the second gadget into x19 and jump. This time it will return immediately. So now I have explained the return oriented flash reload attacks we, imp we implement in the paper. Now let's look at some case studies. Our testbed is Samsung Galaxy S6 with Android version 5.1.1. Here we present two categories of attacks. Detecting hardware events, which is attack on touch screen, and tracing software execution paths, which is attack on surface flanger. First is detecting hardware events. In Auckland 2016, Dell et al. Pr proposed an interrupt based touch screen side channel. In their paper, they read the interrupt file proc slash interrupts frequently so that they can generate the interrupt time series. And based on the interrupt time series, they can infer the unlock pattern of the user. Interested readers can refer to their paper. However, the proc file system has already been, been restricted in newer Android versions. So without a proc file system, can we learn enough information to con construct the interrupt time series so that enables this unlock pattern attack. Here's a partial workflow of Android touch events. After the touch screen senses a touch, it will call the touch screen driver to do the decoding. Then the input event driver will translate it into Linux input events and pass it to event X. After that, it will pass the event to event hub for future processing. In the input event driver, it will call the input sync function to deliver an event. By flash reloading certain functions, we can construct the interrupt time series so that it enables pre previous unlock pattern attack 
even if the proc file system does not exist anymore. Second is the attack to trace software execution path. This is a partial workflow of Android display system. Both the system and the application will control services to, for drawing display contents. Service will first enqueue to the buffer queue and then be composited by service stranger onto the display. When the display needs to be updated, the service stranger will call post frame buffer to send the buffer to display. By flash reloading this function, we can learn sensitive information about the user's behavior. Our first example is detecting push notifications. On the right hand side is our flash reload result. This figure is actually a line point chart. In this figure, millions of points are connected by a single line. If, uh, if uh, the flash reload reading is higher than 240, we will truncate it to 240. So basically, 240 means high reading, and 170 means low reading. We can see there are two bars here. A bar is actually a collection of low readings. So here are two bars when x equals to 1 and x equals to 4. The interval between the two bars is 3 seconds, which is exactly the time a notification stays in the status bar. By, detect by detecting the occurrence of push notifications, the attacker can infer the user's private action on a smartphone. We can also detect other display updates. Here we use the Discover app as an example. In this app, there is a password field in which there is a blinking cursor. On the right hand side is our flash reload result. We can see that there are a bunch of evenly distributed thin bars. The interval between the two bars is 0.5 seconds, which is exactly the time, the, which, is, which is exactly the cursor blinking interval. This figure shows the result after we typed five characters into the password field. We can see that previously organized bars became abnormal. And the number of anomalies is exactly five, corresponding to the five characters we have entered. So this capability can leak into keystroke information to the attacker. Although we only present two examples here, there are other attacks that can be implemented in a similar way. Here are some practical issues we need to consider. First is CPU frequency. The CPU frequency may vary, which will affect our timer. However, in our experiment, we found that after we start our attack, the CPU frequency will soon reach the maximum. So it's no problem here. Second, power consumption. With our attacking app running in the background, 1.5% battery will be consumed per 20 minutes. So our attack will not drain the battery and it's not easily detectable. Third, although Samsung Galaxy S6 is ARM VA based, 32 bit libraries and apps can still be used. Therefore, we have implemented two types of attacking apps to attack both 64 bit and 32 bit libraries. Here are some possible countermeasures to defeat our attack. One simple solution is to disallow user space cache flushes. However, this method has some side effects, such as dis disabling self modifying code. Another easy way is to restrain fine grained time measurement so that we cannot measure time accurately. Similarly, this method will make many benign apps and system services that rely on accurate time me me measurement unstable. One possible solution is to prevent physical memory sharing between the attacker and the victim. The copy on SS mechanism proposed in the next paper in this session looks promising. Zichao will talk about her paper after my presentation. Now let me conclude my presentation. In our paper, we explored the 
effects of clear cache system call and the cache inclusiveness on ARM. We designed a novel return-oriented flash flow mechanism that works on ARM devices. We also showed two categories of flash reload attacks on Android devices. Thank you for your attention. I will take questions now. So we have uh, some time for maybe one, one and a half questions. We start with a half question. This thing is any question? Yeah. Oh, there's a question. Could you please? I don't see anything here. Of this light. Okay. Hi, my name is Moritz Lipp. I'm from Graz University of Technology. Mm -hmm. And I have a question because on the Samsung S6 with ARMv8, you have flush instruction which can be unprivileged in the end. So you can execute them from user space. Have you tried those as well? So you mean there are some uh, unprivileged cache instruction? Yeah, because they're cache maintenance functions. And on ARMv7, you can't use them at all. But on ARMv8, you can use them. So I I, um, I only know some um, cache flash instruction they can use by a kernel, but yeah, they for can be unlocked for user space, and it's the case for the S6. Yeah, actually I I don't know that, but uh, okay. in our case the cache uh, clear cache system call you don't need to do anything, and uh, you can just uh, execute it. Yeah, because they would also work on the data side, because you can also on the Flash from instruction side, right? So, this system call, if on the data side, it will only clear the data cache instead of invalidate it. Okay. So, the clear cache will clear the data cache and invalidate the instruction cache. So, which which means that it has no effect on the shared L2 cache on the data side. Okay, and the other thing is that you said that. Um, there's no difference with your measurements for D2 and D3, I think, that they should be the same like D4, like 